stocks, bonds, ETFs, straight out of downtown Chicago. This is Zach's Market Edge. Welcome to Zach's Market Edge, the podcast about investing in your life. I'm your host, Tracy Reinick, and this week I'm joined by Eric Dutram. He's the editor of Zach's Surprise Trader Service, and we have earnings season fast approaching, so that's why I asked him to join us this week, because we're going to talk about how to trade earnings season, because that's what he does in that service. And I know a lot of people like to, Eric, because I get tweeted at about this all the time. I tweet out a lot of the earnings charts, like the surprise charts, and people are always like, you know, Tracy, are you in there? Are you playing this? <laughs> it's like asking me. Yeah. Or like, do you think they're going to beat? Do you think they're going to miss? <laughs> like they, they ask do they both use things, that voice? Kind too? of. <laughs> yeah. They're always like, you know, sending me these crazy messages. <laughs> and, you know, I just tweet out the chart, but it's always interesting because I'll tweet out some of the ones um, that where the company hasn't missed. Our charts go for five years. And it'll list on there, all the little green arrows means they haven't missed in that entire time period. So, you know, I'm thinking the odds have to be pretty good that they're going to beat again. Sure. Of course, nobody beats for forever. Sure. But I do look, I think one of the keys for anyone who's trading earnings season, a good place to start are those surprise charts. Definitely. And just just so people know what we're talking about, on the quote pages on Zax.com, it's the price and EPS surprise. It's on the left-hand side. And you can see... Not only you know when they missed and beat, but the percentage of right. the of the miss, which can be you know just as important as if they missed or not. So, right. Um, I mean, some of these companies that do beat quarter after quarter, it's definitely a good sign because they've shown an ability to manage Wall Street's expectations. So that's that's a positive. Right. But let me just say on that note, I get I get this tweeted at me all the time too because I'll say, oh, it's very impressive. They haven't missed in five years, and then I get the old. Like, well, anyone can do that, you know, (laughs) but I keep track of who has beat for five years. I have this little um, list taped to my desk and little is really the term for it. There's some I miss because it might be a smaller company. I'm not paying as much attention. I find a new one every once in a while, but it's usually the same. Obviously, it's over five years, so it's the same cast of characters and it's only like 40 companies, maybe, out of the ones I routinely look right. at, which is a lot of stocks I look at every earnings season, and you do too. And so this whole thing like, oh, it's so easy to beat every quarter. Like, that, no, it's it, not. It's definitely something that's difficult to do. But um, you also have to consider companies that just barely beat quarter after quarter. Johnson & Johnson's a decent example of this trend. Yeah. Um, they've beaten every quarter you know, since at least 2012 but they've never had a beat by more than 8% in any of those quarters. So, yeah, they've managed to, you know, contain Wall Street expectations, but then again, you know, it's a it's a pretty staple business. So, you know, what do you expect? But uh, sort of on the flip side of that trend, we have Priceline. Priceline actually hasn't missed in five years. And right. that's a little more volatile. So, uh, you know, kudos to them for, for managing Wall Street expectations over the years. But, but it might be a little dicier uh, coming up. So. It, it might be. And just looking at those two charts. Now, we're on the podcast, so we can't actually show this to anybody. But Johnson Johnson's trading at all-time highs. Like, they've been soaring for quite some yeah. time. And that is, you know, you think of a company that is always beating on the earnings as probably, but not always, you know, the, the shares are going to rise on that news and some good things are going on there. Right. But then I look at the Priceline chart. It's that's not so good. It it's hasn't not been so good, good for a couple of years. Definitely, I was going to say a couple of years ago was a pretty solid trend. But as, as you pointed out, they're uh, really you know in rocky times right now. It's actually Zach's ranked number four as we're as we're doing this podcast. So uh, much rougher situation for for Priceline. So so I guess that leads to the whole. You can look at the surprises, and you want somebody that has a good track record, but that's not always going to get you where you want to go. Definitely. Like with the higher share price. Um, but okay. So what about one of these companies that is beating, beating, beating this kind of happened with Apple, um, for a while they beat for like seven years in a row or something it was. And then Steve Jobs died and then they missed, I think it was at least twice in a row. And now I think they're back on track to beating again. (laughs) And then Target, they beat every quarter for over five years. And then two quarters ago, suddenly, whoops, they missed. It's kind of shocking. Yeah. I'm like, wait, did I hear that right? That can't be because you're so used to it. And the shares were up on that shares one. Shares surged after that miss. Yeah. So 
Do, are you forgiven if you've beaten all that time, if you missed just the, like one time? Well, I, I think for some of these companies, and Target's a great example of this, uh, the guidance actually tends to play a much bigger role in their in their story. Uh, Target boosted their guidance following that miss. So people are much more forgiving if you say, hey, you know what? Last quarter wasn't great, but next quarter, that's the one that's going to be great. So you guys should stick with us. I, I think that's a much better situation for investors. And if, if we look to Target's chart, um, they, they, you know, they surged after that, yeah. that guidance uh, hike, but, you know, they've kind of been they've in a rocky time down, and they've yeah. come completely back down. Yeah. So, uh, you know, investors are like, okay, you know, we'll give you a chance to show us that this guidance is real. And if you don't deliver, then it's going to be some, some tough times. Okay. So the second prong investors should look at are traders who are, you know, play, playing these earnings reports. The first one is, you know, their track record. Mm-hmm. Check that out. And then obviously guidance, but there's nothing, you don't know the guidance, yeah, guidance until the guidance comes out. Yeah, you can't really predict the guidance. Right. So some of them, you don't really, it, it's a crapshoot kind of. Is that how you look at it? I mean, <laughs> un- unfortunately, it, it's, uh, you know, it's, it's not really something that you can, you can tell ahead of time. So right. you got to kind of go off the track record. And then we also use this system here, uh, Zach's ESP, it stands for earnings, um, uh, sorry, expected surprise prediction. So we like to see uh, analysts that are raising estimates right into the number. Generally, that's a good sign that they think, you know, guidance has a chance to go higher because why would why else would they be raising estimates into the number, especially for the current year and full year? That can be a better predictor of how the company's going to do a little further out. So I like to look at those numbers as as kind of a the best signal we really have for uh, for guidance. Okay, because. I know the analysts are kind of loath to raise into numbers. So if they are, they must know something yeah, or we, think something. We, we usually take that as a very good no. sign. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So what else can trip up? Um, so say they, they beat, they're, you know, they did everything right. Guidance, guidance was actually good. But what else can trip up someone on trading these sure. earnings reports? Uh, you know, there's a, there's a couple things to note in particular. Uh, profit margins especially in the tech world. Apple's a great example here. Uh, that's actually one of their main concerns was the iPhone wasn't as profitable as it used to be. So that, that was kind of a, a big, uh, big selling point for investors in terms of why they were trying to get out of that stock. Uh, revenues, that can also be key for some of these companies, and especially ones that don't actually have a positive earnings number. Um, investors are willing to forgive that, that negative earnings if they're starting to grow revenues. A, a lot of people believe after a while, they'll sort of grow into profits. So that's another more tech-focused one. Uh, costs in general is another area to look at. Higher inventory. What does that mean? What is what is higher costs? Um, just for like Google is a good example in their previous quarter. The actual uh, search business was pretty solid, but they're spending more money on their so-called moonshot projects. So in- investors are starting to say, hey, this might be more of a, a long-term thing. And, you know, those results are a little uncertain. So I know uh, Google is one of the ones, they mainly do this with tech companies, I feel, where they also look at the number of employees because in their um, earnings release, they always say, you know, number of employees is now 20,748. And then it's easy to go back at the, la- the prior quarters and say, wait a minute, it was only 19,200. They've hired 1,500 people in right. three months. Oh my gosh. Right. And like, there has been some freakouts about just that one little data point. Definitely. But they only do that, it seems to me, with the tech companies. Yeah, yeah, because and a lot of these ones are very secret about what they're actually doing with these new people. Right. So, <laughs> and generally, when they start these new divisions, they're not going to be profitable right in the beginning. And I think Google's a great example. They're pumping a lot of money into their Google Fiber, uh, which probably is going to work out pretty well in the long term. But it's a question of when in the long term. Investors don't really like that. That's why we saw a sell-off, and that's why it missed earnings because the actual Google search business had a great quarter. So. Uh, it's this other concern from the other side of the business and what sort of the, the overall cost picture is looking like for the company. Okay, now that you brought up Google, they're one of the ones every time I tweet out their their surprise chart that it stinks. Like they miss yeah. more than they beat. So if I'm trading that, I can't really trade the Google. Yeah, and I mean, there's <laughs> we, we were talking about this before. Um, there's a couple companies out there that you can't really even look at their their surprise uh, history. Okay, so these uh, are exceptions, exceptions to the to other the rule. rules yeah. we gave. <laughs> yeah. What what's another uh, one if Google? Tesla is a great example oh, here. Oh yeah. And once again, it's these sort of companies that have this um, long-term vision and they're they're able to convince investors that hey, don't worry, this quarter might not have been that great, but look forward to the future. We're going to be doing these amazing things. Tesla perfect example. Stock has, you know, it's been floundering lately for 
you know, different reasons, I'm, I'm sure we'd, we'd yeah. say, <laughs> but over its lifetime, it's, it's had a very, you know, hit or miss uh, track record in the earnings season, but the stock has really taken off since their, since their debut. So, you know, some companies are able to do this, but it's very few. You really got to be able to sell that, that vision for the long term. Yeah, it's probably only a handful yeah. of those. But so stay away from those is what I would yeah. say. And then uh, one other one other aspect that might be useful to look at besides besides earnings is this idea of user numbers, uh, more or less. So like a company like Twitter, the revenue and the earnings, it's not quite as important as are you growing your user base? Same thing with like a LinkedIn. So this is more important in the social area. Um, some analysts do have targets for, you know, okay, we want to see uh, Twitter grow their user base by, you know, X percent. So if companies aren't, aren't doing very well on that, that metric, it, it can also be kind of a bad sign. Uh, and then lastly, one other one is same store sales. That can also really impact retail and the, oh, yeah. and your favorite sector, favorite. the restaurants. Yeah. I always look at that with the restaurants and the retailers. That's the first thing I go to yeah. look at. I don't even care that much about the beat or the miss or whatever exactly. they're well, doing in that. Yeah. So that perfect, is one of them. Perfect yeah. example then. Yeah. Because it really tells you a lot by, you know, what they're doing with those same stores. Right. Sales. And if they're, you know, sort of their new products, you know, like for restaurants, if they're actually, you know, sparking some, some increase in, in sales. Right. As opposed to just opening a bunch of new restaurants. Exactly. Okay. That's all good to look at. Okay. So what, what do I do if I'm interested in trading something? They report in like, say, two weeks or so, and suddenly they come out with a pre-announcement of like a preliminary earnings is what they usually call it. Is, is that like a dead trade then in terms of trading the earnings? Because they usually, they don't give you specific EPS. Sometimes they do actually, now that I'm thinking about it. <laughs> I'm yeah. going back in my mind. A lot of times they'll tell you the sales um, but basically, if they do give you the EPS, the analysts just come out and like either raise or lower to get in right. line with the the preliminary. So then, why do I want to trade that? I yeah. don't. I, I do think I? it's kind of dead. Um, part they might do this pre announcement. I think you got to look at why they did the pre announcement. Sometimes they just more or less have to for legal reasons. You know, they can't have some investors know something and other investors not know it, so they kind of have to get it out to everyone if you know certain information is leaked. But I actually did some research on pre announcements. And there's actually uh, negative pre-announcements outnumber the positives two to one over the last couple of years here. So most of the, most of the time, it's companies saying, hey, you know what? This quarter is not going to be that great. So I think you always want to avoid those companies that aren't living up to earnings expectations. And I think they might do this to sort of soften the blow. Like, let's say you're going to be, you're going somewhere and you're going to be late. If you say to them, hey, uh, you know, I'm going to be like 10 minutes late. You say that ahead of time. People are a little more forgiving than if you just right. show up 10 or 15 minutes late. So I think it's kind of the same thing with the earnings. Um, if you got if you got bad information, if you can sort of soften the blow any way possible, it's always good news. Okay, um, we've been talking mostly about you know trading on these earnings on the long side. I mean, I've gotten plenty of tweets directed at me about being on the short side. Do these earnings surprise? Or misses, can I play the short side on that? Or is that more dubious? It's you know, a, I mean, why would I want to short Google? Yeah, I know they keep missing, but the shares don't always go down on a miss. Right. <clears throat> I, I think that's a little more dubious. And, you know, our uh, expected surprise prediction uh, system, it doesn't really look at the um, the negative side. It, it's, not yeah. as, um, it's not as accurate for the negatives either. So we try and avoid that one. Um, but on the positive side, it does have about an 80% uh, success rate for for picking companies that are going to beat earnings. So that's really where we've focused in on is you know trying to find the companies that are going to positively surprise. There's definitely uh, some strategies you can look at for the short side. I think looking at companies with this negative earnings ESP, where uh, analysts are sort of lowering their estimates into the number, and then a Zach's rank of four or five. Uh, those are those are two areas to look at. And then it's it's kind of like the opposite of what we were talking about yeah. in the beginning, where you know, companies with very poor track records, that, that can also be uh, an area to look at, too. Um, okay. What about, um, you know, if I am thinking that, you know, I want to trade one of these, but I'm unsure, I, I don't want to take the risk, no. like, ahead of time, because, you know, we've seen really huge blow-ups and things that can go either real good or real bad, right. especially the last couple earnings seasons. So... What if I wait until after they report and then try to get in? I mean, I know some people, traders would say, like, that's lame. Yeah. Like, you're not, <laughs> you're not taking the risk. No. But we used to run the surprise trader like that many years ago right. where, you know, because our data showed that you still had upside to 
um, the stock, even after, if you got in after the beat for, you know, a, a certain period of time afterwards because of the momentum and other good things, if they beat analysts, yeah. you know, we'll be raising the estimates. Hopefully the Zach's rank will go up. All of that. Should I, is, is it possible to play these afterwards? I, I think it's definitely possible to do it. And it's probably going to be a much lower risk strategy in this environment. As you highlighted, the past couple earnings seasons have been really rock. We've seen a lot more volatility, even when companies are showing good earnings, uh, good guidance, good revenues, all those key numbers we look at. Um, it's not as, I guess, sexy as, you know, buying before the report and watching, you know, getting that huge, uh, that huge boost. But there's definitely a, uh, a strategy and there's something to be said for buying after the earnings beat so you can make sure that the company is reacting in a positive manner. Uh, we we kind of believe that there's going to be a post-earnings drift, we call it, where the stock will sort of drift higher uh, with these good numbers, and especially if analysts raise their estimates and they and they sort of bump up their numbers on that front. That's going to attract more investors to the stock. So there's there's something to be said for it. It's going to be a lower risk strategy, but it's going to be a lower gain strategy too. Um, what about the size of the company? Do, do you take that into account? Uh, obviously, you wouldn't like the number of shares traded and stuff. You don't want something that is so thinly traded that it gets whipped around on its earnings, good or bad. Right. But does it matter if it's a large cap and a lot of people are in it versus the small cap? Or yeah. I, I don't think it really matters at all. And we've seen that with plenty of the large cap companies that have, have come out in the last couple of years. I mean, take a look at Amazon and some of their recent reports. The stock will go up you know, 10, 20 percent on, you know, right after the number. We see the same same thing with the small side. Um, so it's really just more about what the company is reporting and how surprising their numbers are as opposed to the size of the company. I think that's really the the main determinant of of what's going on in the, in the uh, earnings report and the reaction to it. Do you have any advice for people who are going to be trade the earnings report, like how to stay kind of sane or, you know, how to keep their, <laughs> how to keep their wits about them? Because sometimes you get the beat, it can be good earnings guidance. It'll be, you know, oh, fantastic same store sales. And it was our record quarter and we see good things going forward and it trades down. Yeah. I guess uh, that's just the roll of the dice. Yeah, that's just what happens sometimes. It's roll the dice. And it's, I think you've got to take more of like a baseball uh, approach to it where you got to swing a bunch of times. There's going to be times that you're going to, you know, whiff on the, on the pitch and you just got to be uh, prepared to roll with the punches there. And then just focus on having the winners, uh, letting your winners run and cutting the losers very early so you don't have a bunch of losers dragging down your portfolio. Let the ones with the good earnings momentum kind of stay in there and uh, ride those as opposed to the other companies. I think that's that's kind of the key to look for in the uh, in the earnings season in general. And maybe don't be attached yes. to, the, to the stock. Yeah, don't love your stock. Right. We'll never love you back. Right, right. that's, that's right. Saying. Especially during earnings yeah. season. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so this is some good... Good guidance for everybody who's about to enter into Q2, basically earnings season coming forward. Um, again, some of the tickers we mentioned were Johnson & Johnson, which is J&J, Priceline, which is PCLN. Neither one of those has missed in the last five years. Um, we had Target. They only missed once. That was two quarters ago. So they're back on track, it seems. That's TGT. Uh, we mentioned Apple and Google, um, Tesla, TSLA, of course, Twitter, TWTR. Um, I'm, I think I'm getting most of them there. Um, a lot of the big names here, but there's some good examples there of things people should go and check out. I will still, this earning season, be tweeting out a ton of these earnings charts. And so people can see what we're talking about with the surprises on there. That's what those up or down arrows mean. So you can check out my Twitter feed. I'm just at Tracy Reinick, either on Twitter or on StockTwits. They'll be in both places. And then I know Eric, you do the videos. That's right. I do a series of earnings preview videos each week, um, and those are going to highlight the main companies to watch over the next five days for earnings. And then a couple times I'll take a look at some of the big companies and say either what went right for their report or what went wrong, try and delve into the numbers a little more in, in detail. So definitely look for that in early July when we uh, when the earnings season kicks back around again. Or you can follow me on Twitter, Eric at Eric Dutrum, for, uh, yeah. for tweets on all these videos as well. Yeah, and you can also check in with Dave Bartosiak right. here because he's doing these earnings preview videos that are like live on the, on the day before the or maybe of. The it's, day it of. It varies, I guess, the day of. It's usually the day of, and he kind of highlights some options trades that uh, yeah. investors can make, either bullish or bearish, depending on how they feel. A lot of people like to play options with these. Definitely. So definitely check in with Dave. He'll be doing a lot of the hot stocks. So check that out. And you can also, of course, find all of our articles and everything about earnings 
um, the earnings headquarters on Zacks.com. Um, definitely check out Shrasmian's articles. He, you know, updates it weekly on everything going on with earnings season, who's beating, who's missing in the S&P 500 and how uh, the, you know, revenues are looking and all of that with some nice charts. Yeah. So check that macro, out too. A good macro perspective with some sector focus too. Ex- yes, definitely. So a lot of good information there. I know there's a lot of information out there, but if you're going to be trading it, you better know these things. So definitely check us all out. You can check out our other podcasts, of course, on SoundCloud. We're also on iTunes. And um, there's some also some good trading podcasts on there. So be sure to check those out as well. Um, for Eric and myself, we'll see you again the next time. <laughs>